So hi everyone and welcome to the D4 podcast. Today I have with me Dimitri Schneider, currently the Chief Operating Officer at Chessable. He is also the Chief Financial Officer of Play Magnus and International Master. Uh, he's a pre uh, previous executive director at JP Morgan. He went to the University of Texas at Dallas on a chess scholarship. He has so much achieved under his name. So I would like to welcome you, sir, and I hope you have a great time. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Very happy to be here. <laughs> Yeah, so we so I have some questions that I made up myself and I have some that I asked the audience of my YouTube channel to actually submit their questions to ask you. I, I know like you have answered this question to so many um, like podcasters or interviewers maybe, but uh, just to give everyone else a context, when did you start playing chess? I started playing chess at the age of six and a half. And I guess it was because I wasn't very good at some of the other sports I tried, like uh, figure skating, you know, like I did that right before and I was so bad that as soon as that event happened and I got carried off, my dad took me to a chess club the following day. Uh -huh. And um, and then things kind of like took off. Um, I started getting pretty good pretty quick. I was like number top three, maybe under eight. Uh, in the United States. And then I think the the breakthrough came when I was 11. Uh, I played my first world championship under 12 in Spain. And that was the first time I got to travel internationally for a tournament. And the tournament was in Menorca. It was beautiful, like this beautiful island and bright skies and you know, a lot of interesting people and it was one game a day and it was fun. And I was like, wow, I, I got to get better so I can do this more often. And um, it kind of, I think, went from there. Now, what was your rating at that time? Did you only have a USCF or did you also have a FIDE? I don't think I had a FIDE rating at that time. I was probably about master strength. Um, I became a master at 12 and this was right before. So I was probably a little bit under 2200 at that time Some, something like that i don't remember exactly uh huh so did you not find any fide tournaments in the united states or or is it because uscf is like really popular in the uh, states and fide wasn't that uh, popular there yeah um i think i don't really remember at that time exactly i feel like I, there was a shortage of feeding rated tournaments for people that were like under 2000. I think at that time, and you know, this was, I'm going to date myself here, but this was like 96, you uh -huh. know, um, 25 years ago. So I think recently the feeder ratings started becoming more uh, common for people under 2000. But at that time, it was mainly folks that were like above 2100 or 2200. Uh -huh. So I, I just don't think there were that many feeder rated tournaments. Uh, it was mostly USDF. What other sports did you actually try before chess? Like before chess? Well, I started playing chess very young, right? So I just I vividly remember figure skating, <laughs> which uh -huh. was very short. <laughs> yeah. um, but but during my uh, as I was learning chess, I played basketball for my school team. Uh, I played tennis, and you know. I still play, try to play tennis. You know, I played uh -huh. for my high school team there. And then uh, I also did some karate uh, when I was much younger. <laughs> but it was a lot of discipline that, that was needed. Uh-huh. So what did your schedule look like? Uh, how much did you practice in a day to, like, become a master level player? Because I think you have to manage uh, your time with school, and that wouldn't that be difficult? Yeah, um, I definitely had to manage the time, you know, I didn't, I, I, I played a lot on the weekends, you know, definitely play tournaments at least twice a month. I had a lesson with a coach once a week, I think, for two hours. Um, and then my own, I might have done a one or two hours uh, every day, but I don't think it was I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure how strict my studying was. I think it was a lot of like playing an internet chess club and 
uh, going over books that I liked and doing a lot of puzzles and stuff. But I, I don't think it was very like regimented, like, okay, 30 minutes today, I do puzzles and then another 30 minutes I do end games and another hour I do openings. It was kind of like whatever I wanted to do and whatever I was interested in. Um, but definitely a lot of tactics and going over you know, master's games and stuff. Yeah, who was your coach, by the way? I had several coaches throughout my, my time. You know, first it was Gennady Sigalchik. Uh -huh. uh, he's a grandmaster. He's still there in, in the U.S. and he has a school. He was great. Then it was Rafael Klosky, who unfortunately passed away. He's oh. really kind of like brought me up to um, about a game master 2400 level. And then I studied with Grandmaster Igor Novikov oh. for quite some time. Uh, and then, uh, you know, various people throughout time, you know, in sort of lesser amounts. Like I studied with Mark Goretzky for a little bit. Um, did a couple of sessions with him, Grandmaster Golden. You know, there's a, there's a few others. Which one of them was like the one you really liked and and like what do coaches uh, mainly focus on w when they want to actually help a player uh, grow? So I mean, what what are the things that you would recommend to a new player to start with? And what was the most hard to learn, basically, for you? And what do you recommend to new players? Yeah, I mean, all those coaches added something different to my chess progression. You know, they were very important for the time that I was with them. You know, it doesn't mean that every coach is good for every part of your chess career. You know, like some uh -huh. people are better when you're just starting out because they instill the passion in chess and like teach you, you know, you know, just get you hooked because that's the most important thing for coaches that's teaching the beginners or people who are starting is to make sure they just see the beauty of the game uh -huh. and really find, you know, the best of what chess has to offer and see glimpses of that so that they want to go and learn on their own and continue playing. Like without that, it doesn't matter how great their technical expertise is, um, uh -huh. how good their openings are or anything else, because, you know, if you don't really, um, understand or don't really like or not don't find a hook to chess then you'll just stop you know so the best thing to do is just get people hooked so they they start learning on their own and then they will find the things that they want to study and then they will dig deeper and like learn the things that they need to learn so i think that's like number one um but then you know after people get to a certain level it's really instilling the fundamentals um you know it's putting pieces in the right squares making sure that it's not uh, it's not about just trying to form a checkmate or going for some crazy gambits. It's really trying to take the long term approach, even if there's not like a quick win. Um, yeah. You know, and, and I think like teaching people how to do that um, is really important because a lot the problem with getting bad fundamentals from the very beginning is that you could reach a certain level. You know, maybe it's 1,200, maybe it's 1,400, maybe it's 1,000, maybe it's 2,000, you know? But uh, it's hard to break those bad habits. Like, it takes yeah. an incredible amount of time to break those bad habits rather than just starting out from scratch, even if you lose in the beginning, because nothing comes easy in the beginning, you know? So I think those are, those are kind of like the main things. Because openings, you know, it all depends on style. Yeah. It depends on people's strengths. It's, uh, that's, I think, I don't think that's the number one thing. Yeah, so was there like some level that you were stuck on for some time uh, and you had to like really force uh, yourself to beat that barrier? Yeah, you know, I got stuck at like this 2000 to 2200 level. Yeah. And granted, I was very young. I think I was like 10, <laughs> uh -huh. 10, 10 or 11. But at that, you know, my progression from like six and a half till 10 was basically go from five to 600 level to like 2000 in a straight line. And, you know, it took a lot of time to rework a lot of my habits, you know, go from gambits and stuff where like I would play the center game, you know, <laughs> yeah. even against like 2200s, um, which I just wouldn't, I can't, you can't beat a master if you play the center game, you know, on a consistent basis, you put your queen out in the center on a second move. Um, 
So I had to like rework the proper like Rui Lopez and like some other openings. And it takes time, you know, because when you start first start playing a new opening, uh, you're probably going to lose because you don't know it as yeah. well. And so it, it takes a lot of time. It takes to learn it, then play it, then iterate on it. Um, and then the second thing I really pushed myself on was end games uh, oh. because I realized, and my coach has told me this, but I realized that if I could learn the end game better, um, I would, even if I was rated 2100, I would have better end game skills than a lot of 23, 2400s because many of them didn't study that deeply. And so that just gave me incredible confidence. Uh, and that confidence is like the most important thing when you're trying to raise a level, right? Whether you're going for an international master norm or not, it's like, can I beat these players that I'm trying to, that are higher rated than me? After kind of like iterating for maybe six to 12 months, I gained probably two to 300 points in maybe like six months. I, I got to 2350 super fast um, after that little plateau. Yeah, I mean, for like 500 to 2004 years is insane. This is, uh, that's like a really quick uh, uh, increase in your rating. And then you said you went from 2000 to 2300. That's even better in six months. So uh, I believe uh, you're like uh, a genius. <laughs> and you, you're like, no, an, no, no. <laughs> you're like an inspiration to like so many people that uh, uh, i appreciate yeah. that but now nah, i don't I'm far from a genius there are many people that have achieved much higher ratings um in recent years so i think yeah i'm but, proud of what i did uh, but i'm definitely know my limits <laughs> uh, yeah and after that uh could you tell us a story of getting the scholarship at the university i mean what what are the universities you apply to and like um yeah yeah, the, basically the scholarship so, story, yeah. Yeah, I was very fortunate to get a scholarship from University of Texas at Dallas. Um, I applied to, you know, the two main universities that were giving scholarships at that time. Now I think there are many more. So there was yeah. University of Maryland in Baltimore County. Um, and I had friends in both places, you know, and University of Texas at Dallas. I also applied to some non-chess oriented schools like Binghamton University, you know, which is the top state university yeah. in New York applied to Michigan University, uh, Princeton, you know, and I didn't get into Princeton, unfortunately. Yeah. I didn't study enough during high school to, uh, to, to get good enough grades um, and scores to do that. But I got into most of the universities that I applied to. I think it ultimately came down to two things or three things. The first one was money for sure, yeah. was nice. You it's know, this was like a full ride. Was, yeah. It was expensive back then too, even with a scholarship at a school like Michigan, it was still gonna be something like $25,000 a year, you know, and that was a lot of money at that time, um, still is. Uh, so money was for sure a factor. Number two was flexibility. I was still very much interested in becoming a better chess player. Um, I think I just became an IM at that time. I became an IM at 17. So I was still very much hopeful I could tried to go for grandmaster title if time allowed during my studies. And I knew that if I wanted to go away for a tournament for two weeks, um, you know, or if I wanted to play in the summer, like there was potentially additional funds, like they had additional, you know, stipends for travel. So I, I knew that they would be quite flexible and supportive of me playing in tournaments. Um, and I did end up taking uh, some time off to play during college. Like you know, I went to Europe and you know, I knew that in other schools, it would be much more difficult to say, uh -huh. to ask a professor, can I take a test on a different day? Because I'm going to be, you know, in Europe playing a, an important tournament. Uh, so the flexibility um, was was quite important, uh, was quite important to me. And and the money was quite, was quite important too. So uh, yeah, I think those are kind of like the main thing from my consideration. There might've been one more, but I didn't. Uh -huh. probably part of those two yeah so when did you decide that finance is for you because i i think you took a finance major in uh your university and were you like really good at maths or something that you wanted to pursue finance or like what was it no i mean i was good at math i think in my very young age um <laughs> when i first moved to the u.s like i had 
pretty good math skills, probably ahead of my time, but then they became, I think, quite average pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think I would consider myself good at math per se. Uh, pretty good at pattern recognition and some other things, but not math calculations and, you know, like abstract math is very difficult for me, like I'm quite tangible. Um, and maybe I would have been better at it if I put more effort into it, but uh, I don't know. I, I took a finance class and I just love the idea of analyzing businesses and trying to understand how, you know, they generate revenue and profit and what are the key drivers and sort of how everything sort of fits together. Um, and so I, I was quite interested and I was interested in a lot of things at the time, but uh, finance and business was sort of an economics, you know, it just kind of appealed to me from um, a general perspective. It, I just was, in, I would read all the books that I could on that topic, you know, it, I drew, it drew me in. Yeah, also in the, in the, I've heard that in the universe, uh, basically the university is very famous for its uh, um, chess players and their uh, coaches and stuff. So when you decided to go to the university on the scholarship, did you like actually uh, consider that uh, the university is known best for its chess players and, um, and uh, how was your chess team like over there? Were their players like uh, uh, even better than you at that time? Or um, how was the situation of chess in the college? Yeah, you know, yeah, that was probably the third reason that slipped my mind. You know, definitely the chess team was very well respected at UT Dallas, and it led to more opportunities for me. You know, like I was the commencement speaker, um, you know, at my graduation. That was like something I'm proud of, and I got accepted into. Uh, this art, the Archer program, which is like for a very select group of people across the state of Texas. I'm pretty sure without being part of the chess team, I wouldn't get noticed nearly as much. So that, that was definitely really cool um, that we were recognized, you know, to some degree by the administration. Uh, the, the, team, the, the team, yeah, I don't think I was the best player. I mean, maybe for some years I was, but then, you know, there was many other strong players that were there. There's definitely various grandmasters um, mm -hmm. that came on board. So I think it was, uh, you know, it was all quite close. Nobody was heads and, head and shoulders above, but uh, I don't, I definitely wasn't the best player all the years. That's, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so what was your motive behind launching uh, BGS Chess in college in your university? I mean, uh, what exactly is it? And what do you think was missing in the chess community that you wanted to solve? Yeah, BGS Chess was an after-school chess education provider. Um, mm -hmm. And we also did camps and tournaments. And there was definitely a need for more chess programs in around Dallas area at that time. You know, there was a lot of, it was a fast growing uh, area. You know, there were new districts popping up all the time. And as in most places, there was just a shortage of teachers. And so, you know, I was lucky to partner with some great people. Arminio Bias was one of the best chess teachers I've ever come across. Unfortunately, he's passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin Gardner, who runs a very successful academy in Houston now. And so we came together and, you know, just uh, organized uh these after school programs and various activities and I, I hired some of my college teammates who i knew were you know could use some money and were you know good good teachers and i think it was just great for for everybody um and you know now i'm in the chess business as well um yeah. but at that time i could I, I i really understood that there just needs to be a chess program in every school in the us you know and Texas and that part of Texas was just a perfect example of it. And being part of UT Dallas, the least we could do is help, you know, set that up, um, help the community and expand the reach of chess um, beyond like the campus. So that, that, was, that was BGS Chess. That was a great learning experience for business, uh, for sure. Dealing with people, dealing with uh, hiring people, you know, seeing what qualities were uh, really important, uh -huh. like reliability, being on time, 
dealing with parents who, you know, sometimes, you know, they, they're not happy with certain things, you know, and I was like this 20 year old kid, you know, calming parents down because their kid like maybe didn't get enough attention during class or something like that, <laughs> you know, so it was, um, you know, doing the books, PL, uh, profit and loss. So yeah, it was just an awesome experience. I it really, um, you know, I, I really thought a lot after, if, after graduation, expanding that business. Uh, yeah. But then, you know, the investment career kind of presented itself and I put that on hold. Yeah, so speaking of the same thing, uh, I heard in a previous interview with someone, I had heard that you were thinking of going for the Grandmaster title, but then you started working for JP Morgan. Was that like a, a, a financial decision just because uh, chess players have uh, less of an income uh, if you're not a top level player? Or was it because... Uh, or was it because it was just better? And what are your thoughts on the income of a chess player um, who's like an, a medium uh, leveled in, in experience? Yeah. You know, I, I did, I was thinking about becoming Grandmaster. At that time, I already reached level of 2,500. So I had the rating um, and I missed, you know, Grandmaster. I didn't play that many tournaments, but I played a decent number and I, Towards like that time, 2005, 2006, 2007, I, I was just missing norms by like a half a point. So I just, you know, but I was, I was also going to school at the same time. It was hard to kind of give it 100%. So my, my thinking was after I graduate, I would just give it a year and really just play in Europe, go on a circuit and try to make it work. Um, and I did that for a few tournaments, you know, got really close. And then, um, yeah, JP Morgan, like, through a connection from my internship, you know, I met somebody, I was like, I, I want to, I'm interested in the internship, like the following summer, this was, uh -huh. you know, in September. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, you know, we have space for you. Okay, cool. And then they called me back in November and said, hey, we know you're, you're not really working right now. So um, we have a spot for you right now. <laughs> and so I took it, um, and my consideration was, I knew that you know what what they were offering me at that time was quite good. Um, I was very happy with that. That was not the kind of money that I was used to seeing. I was like, wow, I, how many World Opens do I need to win in the Open section to uh -huh. get this annual salary in the first year? You know, and that's just the first year. So, and I knew that I didn't do enough internships in finance because I was playing most summers, you know? So I was kind of like, well, if a brand like JP Morgan is willing to give me a shot, I kind of owe it to myself to take it at this time. And I can always go back to the chess business later. Uh, so that was my first consideration. And, you know, to make a living from chess at that time, and this was like 14 years ago, uh -huh. right? 50, almost 15 years ago, it was, <laughs> excuse me, it was really difficult. Um, you had to be either a top 10 grandmaster or like number one or two in the country, uh, or you had to grind like local tournaments for $500 first prize, um, or, you or you taught, right? Or you yeah. taught or you wrote articles. Most, most people that want to do that became teachers. And, you know, that's something I enjoy, you know, to a selective degree to do it full time, but it was not something that I wanted to do at that particular time. I like the business component of it more. Uh -huh. um, and I still talk selectively, like even when I was at JP Morgan, like to my friends and some other, you know, select clients who I thought had potential. Uh, but now I think the dynamics have really changed. Uh -huh. I mean, you, if you are a master player and you're good at explaining the concepts and you are somewhat decent at social media, you can make a pretty good living, you know, just doing courses on Chessable, doing some streaming, yeah. you know, doing some commentary. Like there's so many avenues and income streams uh, where you really don't need to be a super grandmaster. You just need to be able to clearly articulate um, what you know 
in the chess world and so people can follow you and understand it and you know in, in the past the only thing you could do is uh be a teacher in a local program yes but now because of the internet of course you can reach many more people and with platforms like chessable which you know i was an early part of um which we're very proud of we have really developed something where a lot more than just like the top 10 players can have a very steady income stream if they're willing to work hard. Uh, and so, yeah, the times have definitely changed. And, you know, I think those people really deserve it. And I think it'll only get better. Uh huh. Did you play chess when you were at JP Morgan? Like, did they have like a, they have like a, a team or something? Like, as an extra yeah. thing? Yeah, there was, you know, I think I got maybe lucky, you know, I got hired at JP Morgan because the very senior guy liked that I played chess, like that stood out to him, you know, the <laughs> stereotype <laughs> helped me. But then there was also somebody who was quite senior who was actually like an 1800 player, who was pretty, who was pretty good. And the first thing, like, I think it might have been my first week or first month, he was, <laughs> he was like, hey, let me take you out for a coffee. He's like, we have this league, the Bankers League, like we need you. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, we we had a, yeah we had a team. It was it was cool. It was fun. Yeah. So uh, then, after seven or eight years in J.P. Morgan, uh, what came in your mind that you decided to actually uh, work on Chessable uh, with your friends? Yeah, you know, so Chessable came around in my site around 2017. So I was at J.P. Morgan at that time for almost 10 years. Uh -huh. And I was already, you know, I was lucky enough to be in a pretty good position. I was already a vice president, you know, in a path uh -huh. to becoming executive director, I saved up some money. And I started to, you know, I was Follow looking at other investments. Yeah, like, well, my, my, I had two, two things I was super interested in. One is, of course, chess, but the other is investing. You know, I loved finding companies and ideas and seeing if those can really uh, grow, you know, and deliver value and, you know, if I would be right. And so, but I also wanted to work with entrepreneurs, you know, people who are just very early in their journey. So like startups, uh, do some angel investing. And so I started doing a little bit of that. Those, those were great learning experiences. And then Chessable came on my site, John Bartholomew, my former roommate in New York, and he was also my teammate in UTD. He was a co-founder, you know, I had significant respect for john and so i was like i have to learn more about this you know yeah <laughs> um, chess education like yes like there definitely needs to be some technology here there hasn't been innovation in chess education in the chess world for like for ages decades yeah. ages you know and so i met david the founder and ceo and immediately hit it off and uh, yeah, I, I led the investment round, um, one of their first ones, became a, a lead investor, followed the progress very closely. And I, I was like, of course, chess, like, I know the space, you know, and uh -huh. I know kind of like, at least I have some idea what it takes to make a good business. So it was like a no brainer for me in some ways. And I got very fortunate that David was just super smart and, you know, passionate and uh, just built on the Morgan company, and at some point, I was like, David, I want to come help build this out with you. You yeah. know, like I, I'm willing to forego my, you know, comfortable salary, and I just like I really think this can be big. Like I think this is really important. I think uh -huh. there should be accessible in like everywhere. You know, um, everybody should benefit from this. I wish I had this when I was younger, and studying openings and, and, and tactics and stuff so yeah so that's that's sort of how i uh came on board full-time in 2019. yeah now chessable is a household name everyone knows chessable so i think you were able to achieve what you actually wanted to and and what was, what was your reaction when play when the play magnus group actually approached you guys to buy chessable i mean what's the feeling? yeah it, yeah that was uh a little bit out of the blue you know, um, it was late 2018, early 2019, right after the World Championship in London. Yeah. And 
you know, I remember having a call with Andreas, the CEO. I was, I was in Dubai. I was actually traveling to do presentations with clients. Um, and when I was speaking with him, he was like, look, chess is this huge market. Like together we can really do much more than individually. Um, and I was like, wow, this is, I've been dreaming of this, uh -huh. you know, like, I yeah. know this is a huge market. Like I know nobody really has built something massive. And here were like-minded people who were very successful in other industries that were coming together to do something. And so, uh, you know, that was, that was really refreshing. And uh, so we joined Play Magnus, you know, and, uh, and that's been really exciting. It's been super journey, definitely far from what expected uh, when I initially invested in Chessable, like the small little chess education startup, you know, now of course we're much bigger and have a group of companies. Uh, uh -huh. So it's been really beyond my expectations, this, this whole wild ride. And you had the world champion himself. <laughs> I mean, we got, of course we got the world <laughs> champion himself. That was very, that's been very exciting. Yeah. So how is it like actually working with uh, Henrik Carlson? I think he, he's the guy who like focuses on the company, whereas Magnus uh, plays. Uh, in his tournaments and stuff and yeah how is it like working with uh, Henrik himself and interacting with Magnus uh, now and then yeah no Henrik is great He's a, you know both him and Magnus are huge supporters of the company they're large shareholders you know uh -huh. they're very active you know Henrik is in every board meeting he has very valuable inputs uh, you know he's been of course in the industry forever <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Magnus is just such a superstar that transcends the chess industry. So, and he's, I think, quite humble, actually, you know, even though something he jokes around sometimes, but yeah, he, he is, uh, he is quite, quite humble and very down to earth in, in many ways. And so it's been uh, just a pleasure, you know, to interact with him when we could play some football uh -huh. uh, once in a while, you know, when when we're in the same city so it's a uh, yeah very proud to have somebody like magnus as a uh, one of our key ambassadors of the company he's of course the best player but also he's got high integrity and strong principles and i think he's done a lot of really good for the game yeah have you ever discussed chess theory or something with him because i think that would be so valuable uh, have you actually tried to approach him for something like that or is it always regarding absolutely the not I would never uh, <laughs> ask Magnus for theory, but we, we, we have like, you know, we, there was a charity dinner in London a few years ago and it was like a bunch of people against Magnus and, you know, or not against Magnus, like it was somebody else, but Magnus was around and he was like, you know, think about which move to make. And I was like, oh, like, I don't know. And he would give us some advice, you know, but uh -huh. no, I would never ask Magnus for theoretical advice. Uh -huh. I am too long retired to, uh, to do that <laughs> i mean you're back into the chess industry so do you plan on going for the gm title now i mean maybe you can get back into the game um see i i know what it takes uh -huh. to be at a like a grandmaster level uh, and there's no way i can do anything even close to that given my time constraints at the moment with the responsibilities that i have uh -huh. So I don't want to kid myself to be unrealistic. You know, I think one has to be very realistic with these things. So I think if at some point I had the time, you know, I don't know, five years or 10 years to dedicate like six hours a day or, or you know, four hours a day and be away for like two weeks at a time, uh -huh. it, then like maybe I will take a year and try to see if I still enjoy it um, but it's definitely not enjoyable to play at a level that's several hundred points below where you know you could play because you know I haven't studied openings in 10 years you know I haven't I forgot like a lot of the key technical end game positions you know so like there's there's a lot of um, things that I need to do to sort of uh, refresh my game Let's just put it that way. But, I, you know, I'm doing tactics on Chessable, so still see them uh -huh. quite okay. Yeah. But there's a lot more than that that's, that's required. 
Yeah, so uh, what are the things that you actually manage at Play Magnus being the CFO? I mean, like, give us some overview or something. Yeah, so my, I have a, you know, we all wear multiple hats at Play Magnus. So, you know, CFO, I'm responsible for the financials of the company. That's kind of like the number uh-huh. one job. So basically, all the companies we have, we look at their financials, we can combine them, and then we report them to investors every quarter. So that's my job, uh, along with my team, to make sure that, you know, all the accounting makes sense, all uh-huh. the numbers make sense, make sure we set the budgets, things, things of that sort. Um, then there's, you know, I've been quite involved with the M&A activities that we've done. Uh-huh. So we've acquired several companies last year, like that was something that I worked on quite a bit. Um, and then I'm still pretty, in, you know, involved with Chessable to some degree, you know, with their operations, you know, different things like legal, uh, finance, of course. Uh, so, yeah, kind of like involved in a lot of things in the group, but that are touching like financials or operations. Uh-huh. And one, I have this interesting question. So you're from the financial background. So what are your thoughts on cryptocurrency? and and what are your thoughts on nfts as as an asset like are you against them are you Um, with them or what are your thoughts so i think crypto is here to stay you know there's incredible innovation that's been going on there and i started looking at crypto trying to understand it better in 2017 when it had kind of its went from not being very well known to being kind of mainstream given the price rises and I was just trying to understand it. Like I read a bunch of books on it, tried to kind of, what, like, what is this thing? Uh, and I knew that it was here to stay at that time when a lot of the smart people I knew uh-huh. were starting to go into crypto. Like a lot of people I followed on Twitter that were in at technology firms, you know, were going into crypto. Investors were investing in crypto. Um, finance people were going into crypto. So I knew when, there was, when there's like a lot of money And a lot of really smart folks starting to join the industry. Um, You know, there's a saying like with the stuff that engineers are working on their nights and weekends is the stuff that's going to be like mainstream Uh in in a few years. So I noticed that trend. Uh, So I think it's here to stay. I think, you know, everything is going digital. There's no reason why currency can't go digital either. Uh, And there's just a lot of, you know, crypto economies, the metaverse, yeah, you know, a lot of stuff that science fiction writers were writing about like 20, 30 years ago um, is coming to fruition. You know, you could argue that today, a lot of our time is already spent mostly digital, right? Yeah. Like we're talking now digitally, like people are texting. So, and crypto is a digital currency. So I, I, I think it's here to stay. Uh-huh. Um, now, now, how to value it is a whole different animal. Yeah, it, it just <laughs> you know, rises and then drops like, and it's it's not stable at it's, all. It's still like very early in the stage where the cash flows will be much further out. Although I think that's starting to change a little bit. Like there's various strategies, you know, uh-huh. involved where people can get yields. But I think I think there's still a lot of room for things to get sorted out for regulation and everything. But I think it's here to stay. And I think a natural product of that are NFTs, um, non-fungible tokens. Yeah. You know, it's it's basically, there's so many, like you can be a utility where, you know, if you have an NFT, you can use it and get some extra benefits. That's not very different than real world. It can be just like a work of art where people identify with the community that like the NFT picture represents. Um, so I think that is just the natural evolution of like art and, you know, player cards and identifying with celebrities, players, communities. So, yeah, I think it's, and and of course, Play Magnus, you know, has some NFTs, you know, of the Champions Chess Tour. um, And I think we'll do a lot more of those. Yeah. So, and the last question is that I heard that Play Magnus has become the fastest growing company in the gaming industry in Europe. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, we're very proud of what we have achieved. You know, the last 
several years have just been such a rush. Uh -huh. You know, everybody's been working like 24 seven and really innovating, you know, Chessable very quickly in a few years became the leading e-learning platform and revolutionized how people learn chess as well as how people can make a living from chess. Uh -huh. The Champions Chess Tour, tour like didn't exist one and a half years ago you know it was just kind of like people streaming from their uh homes, homes and now yeah. it's a professional professional studio on the level of any professional sport that's out there like world series of poker or football or f1 you know so like the kind of production quality that we have um and also bringing in tier one sponsors uh -huh. Puma and mastercard and ftx you know and julius bear so there's um you know we did that in one year like who thought uh -huh. that chess could bring in that the, that level of sponsorship um those kind of people that want to be affiliated with a chess company so we're extremely proud you know it's definitely a function of the people at play magnus they've been yeah. the heart and soul of this growth and so it's it's nice to be recognized you know outside of the chess world and in a, in a broader in a broader field yeah and can you tell us something about the neo puma and magnus collab yeah, I mean, you know, Puma, of course, is one of the leading footwear and uh, sports fashion, you know, companies in the world. Um, and they are going to be affiliated with the Champions Chess Tour. They're a sponsor, and Magnus is going to be one of their ambassadors. Uh huh. Uh, we're going to probably have some merch, you know, uh, nice. with okay. chess, and, chess and Puma. So there's already some samples that are out. So it's going to be really cool um uh -huh. you know there's more to come on this but it's it's definitely super exciting yeah so that's all thanks thanks for coming i really appreciate uh the time with you and it was a really nice experience thank you so much great well, thank thank uh -huh. you for inviting me thank you for the questions and yeah yeah pleasure to be here yeah thanks 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 a lot